We're holding Sefer Mishlei, chapter 19. It's better a poor man who walks innocently than one with perverse lips who is a fool. He's comparing the poor man to the wealthy man. And one usually thinks that he is out to gain or is out to benefit a lot more from a wealthy man. And Shlomo Melech says that that's not always so. One is better off, Tov Rash Olech Betumor, one is better off associating, befriending a poor man who, is, who walks innocently. He's not crooked, he's not a liar, he won't cheat you. The chances of you benefiting from him are greater than one who may have money but he has perverse lips, who is a fool. In other words, calls him a fool because that individual who has money may show that he's your friend but not necessarily be a true friend. And that's why he describes it as being one with perverse lips and a fool because he thinks he can fool you, but in the end he's a fool. So, tov rash or lech it is better for one to befriend those who are simple, even though they don't have money. Because at least they are innocent, at least they are good, at least they are predictable, much more than the one who is ikesh svatav, who has perverse lips, who is a fool and therefore unpredictable. You, you will see various pesukim in this perek and another perakim where he makes various comparisons of those individuals who appear to us to be good, but they're no good. And those that naturally society uh, pushes away, shows no sympathy for, but they may be actually better people. And then we will see that as we go along the perek. Gam belo da'at nefesh lotov ve'atz beraglaim hoteh. The translation is, it is also not good that a soul be without knowledge, and he who hastens with his feet sins. There are two concepts over here. One is related to what we just spoke about. We spoke about a simple person who has no knowledge. So Shlomo Amela says, well, it is for the benefit, for the good of that individual that he does, that he does acquire some knowledge, because to be innocent and to be ignorant is not also not good. In order, the commentaries explain that in order for a person to be righteous, to be an honest individual, he has to learn. Innocence is one thing. Righteousness or honesty is a whole different idea. If one does not learn, one does not know what means honest and what does not mean honest. You know, there are certain halachot, what one can do, what one cannot do. Not everything is black and white. So even though it's good, to be innocent, but it's important to be knowledgeable. So that's what he says, Gan belo da'at nefesh lotov. It is also not a good that a soul be without knowledge. And then he explains, Ve'atz beraglaim chote. One who hastens with his feet, he rushes to do things, is rushing to sin. The reason why that happens is because he does not contemplate on what he's about to do. He does not reflect on where he's going, he rushes to do something, and as a result of that, he will make mistakes. So you have an impulsive individual who will also get himself into trouble, not because he's not knowledgeable necessarily, but simply because he does not analyze what he's about to do. People rush into all sorts of shady investments. If they would have thought many times over, if they would have consulted with somebody who's more experienced, they would have been told, this guy's a con artist. Don't give him your money. You know, you know how many people have put down their money on a major project of construction and the contractor ran away with the money? I'm sure you're familiar with at least one such story, either from yourself or from someone else. It is never a good idea to rush into anything. And in this country they say anything that sounds too good cannot be true. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Atz Beraglaim, he's talking about the one who, who hastens his feet. Hote. Why is he a sinner? Because he's karov le mezid. There's something called karov le mezid. In other words, you're not a shogeg, you did not do something unintentionally, you did something closer to mezid. In other words, you, had you looked into it, you would have seen that there's something wrong with it. Since you did not, it's your fault. Now, we're talking about an individual that does things below that. One interpretation was one who, is, who has no knowledge, it's no good. But the second interpretation is to do things without that. 
To do things without that means to not be aware of something. We're not talking about necessarily rushing into it, but just you did something accidentally. And that can happen. The Torah prescribes a korban hatat for someone who does something bishgaga. You did it. You committed a sin unintentionally. Below that, that uh, requires a korban hatat, depending on what was done. What's the korban hatat for? That you bring an animal because you acted like an animal. In other words, you did not think, you did not watch yourself, and therefore things happen accidentally or unintentional. As you know, in Judaism we very much firmly believe that nothing is by accident, really. En mikrim. So how does somebody do a sin by accident? Hashem definitely does not want him to commit a sin. So the rabbis said, tell us that it's very possible that once upon a time he did something intentionally. And as a result of having done once something intentionally, the next time around, it's easier for him to do it unintentional. Kilo yunel tzaddik kol aven. To a tzaddikim, no harm will befall. Hashem will not make them fall and make something, make a mistake. When we talk about mitzvot and averot sins and the like, they are offered certain protection. But Hashem only protects those who first protect themselves. One who does not watch himself, it's very possible the next time around. It will happen again, even though it's unintentional. At one time, it was his fault, because he did it intentionally. So therefore, here, when he says, Gam below dat, nefesh lo tov, even if something is done not intentionally, it's not a good sign. It's, it's a sign that there's something, there's a blemish there from before. Rabbis tell us on, this, on the first few words of this pasuk, Gam below dat, nefesh lo tov, that it is not, we're dealing with an individual who's not a good soul. Why? Because he forces his wife. When we're talking about intimacy, intimacy between husband and wife should be something consensual. When the two are ready, the two want it, not when the husband is in the mood and, and, and forcing the, the, this on his wife. That's called below that, without her approval. So they learn it out from this pasuk too. Not that they need this pasuk, but that is also insinuated in this pasuk that there are certain men who behave this way, and that's a nefesh lotov, that is not a good soul, one who forces his way on his wife. Another example of below that is one who has intimate relationship with his wife close to her veset, close to her menstrual period. A religious observant woman keeps track of her timing, and that's because it's very important. You don't want it to happen at the time when you're together because it's a big sin. There's a certain amount of time, at least a half a day before, depending if the woman is regular or not. If she's not very regular, it's a little bit more complicated. There are certain days that she has to watch out for when the two cannot be together. You don't want to take a chance. It's risky. Throughout the whole month, you don't have to expect accidents. And accidents can happen, but you don't have to expect it during the period when she's clean. But when it gets very, very close, and some women have certain feelings, so headaches and the like right before it happens, or if the date is getting close, you have to be extra careful. So anybody who's not careful, that's also another example of gam below dat, nefesh lotov, this is not a good man. And therefore if he's rushing to do it, he's a chote, he's a sinner. The next pasuk is a very significant pasuk in describing many, many individuals in this world. The way he translates it is a man's folly perverse his way, but his heart is wroth or he's angry with Hashem. I'll, I'll simplify it. It just happens to be that Ivelet Adam, the folly, the mistakes, the shtuyot that a person commits, right? Because of those shtuyot, Tesalef Darko, he is misled. He goes in the wrong direction. It's his personal, it's his fault. He did shtuyot. He committed acts of nonsense, of folly. And it, therefore, tesalef darko, he went astray. Something happened to him. He lost money. He got hurt. Whatever. But guess what happens afterwards? After he gets hurt, Val Hashem is aflibo. He's upset at Hashem. Who am I talking about? I'll give you a quick example. Somebody who just went through the Holocaust. We're not going to judge anyone who went through the Holocaust. We don't know how we would react in their place. So we're not going to judge. But this was a typical reaction by many of them. You exist? God, where were you? How did you allow all this to happen? Right? I'm sure you've heard something like that. These kinds of complaints come because a person is Mesalef Darko. He is devious in his ways. 
he's not following the way of the Torah. He therefore commits shtuyot, or in this case he didn't commit any shtuyot, but he is puzzled. He's puzzled by what happens, and he, and he doesn't have an, an explanation for it, and therefore complains to Hashem. Had he studied Torah, he would not have any questions, he would have no complaints, but because of his shtuyot, because of his pursuit of nonsense, because of him not being a serious individual, therefore, the salef darko, it, it causes him to be devious in his ways, it misleads him, and it, it, it basically turns him off the derech of the Torah. And that is why he complains to Hashem, not realizing that the, the proper thing to do is to accept that out of love, that Hashem knows what He's doing, that uh, there's a reason for everything. And if he would read the Torah, he would have a partial explanation, not a full explanation, but a partial explanation of what exactly happened. During times of pain and suffering, people complain. And those who complain, it's because they don't have that strong faith in Bitachon and Hashem that they would have had they just pursued the regular way, the way of the Torah. But in this case, we're talking about an Ivelet Adam to Salat Darko. He's going by his own personal custom-made way. He wants to do certain things that are contrary to the, to the will of the Torah. And what that does is the Salat Darko, it makes him deviate, and he has his own ideas and his own thoughts of what these things mean. And these thoughts and these ideas are contrary to Jewish perspective and Jewish outlook. The Jewish perspective says a lot about why tzaddik veralo rasha vetovlo, why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. A major concept that uh, is is elaborated in Judaism extensively. There are various pesukim in the Torah. There are a lot of commentaries. But a person who has his own mindset, who did not learn, he has the wrong ideas, and then he complains to Hashem. So it's his own fault. Next pasuk, Hon Yosif Reim Rabim, Edal Mereo Yipared. Wealth adds many friends. We've read a similar pasuk before, but a poor man is separated from his friend. The rich have many friends, and the poor don't. Now, what is he talking about here? What is he adding over here? He says like this Remember, this idea that the rich people befriend them, and the poor nobody wants to be their friend. We've already spoken a little bit about this, but every time that he repeats the idea, that he adds additional information. What he's telling us of here is, this: these are the facts he's saying. You know what? It's just a fact. When people have money, they will also have many friends. Everybody will want to be their friends. And uh, those who become poor, once upon a time they were rich, in other words. They become poor, their friends will leave them. What he's telling us over here is that even though this is the way of the world, this is what you see out there in the street, it shouldn't be like that. In other words, he's telling us you should love everybody regardless of whether they're rich or poor. You should like them at all times, not only when they're doing well. So he's telling us the facts as they are, but he's also communicating to us how terrible this is, how this should not be. You know, he's not just telling us, you know, this is the way life is, and then, you know, no, try to fix it. In other words, don't be, if you're in that situation, uh, if you have any influence, you know, don't allow this to happen. You were friendly to someone who, who once upon a time had money, and now you're no longer his friend. Shame on you. you know, you just liked it for his money, or because he invited you over for Shabbat, or because he helped you out, now he can't, so you're no longer his friend. That's not right. That's not fair. So he's telling us what the facts are, but uh, obviously he's telling us that this is not something that we should be doing. This is not right. A false witness will not go unpunished and one who speaks lies will not escape. That's a good translation. Here we have two individuals, one who is a false witness and one who is Yafiyah Kezavim. Yafiyah Kezavim means one who speaks lies. What does it mean he will not go clean, he will not escape? Even though he appears to, get, to be getting away with it here, we must never forget that just like there is a Bet Din Shilmata, there is a Bet Din Shilmara. There is a heavenly court too. And if the downstairs court makes a mistake, certain things were left out in court that the judge was unaware, or it was a jury, the jury that, that determined something and it's not right, you, don't worry about it. If there were lies involved, the liar will not get away with it. At some point he will be punished by the heavenly court. That's the first part of the Pasuk. Loi malet, 
The second part of the Pasuk said, talking about the one who lies, false testimony, he will not escape. In other words, in the end, all those who lie will be discovered. So he's saying two things. The liar does not get away with it, he's punished. In the end, Loi Malet does not escape, he doesn't get away with it, he will be discovered. Next Pasuk. Rabim Yehalup Nadiv Ishmatan. This is also a similar idea to what we just said. The great will beg the favor of a generous man. I wouldn't say the great here, I would say the many. Many people will will beg the favor of a generous man and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. What is he talking about here? He's talking about something called Ahava Hatluya Davar. In Judaism there is a concept of called a love which is Tluya Davar, which is dependent on something. And there is a love, Shalot Luya Davar, which is more platonic or altruistic, they call it in fancy English. It's a pure love. He says, when you see people who, are, who befriend someone who gives out money, who is very generous, you should know that for the most part, this is a Havashet Luya Davar. They don't love him. It's only because of the money. That's the second part of the Pasuk. And everyone is a friend of a man who gives gifts. And that is why the Bale Musar used to say as follows. You want to test a friend that you've been kind to? You think he likes you? Stop being kind to him. In other words, don't be cruel. But stop being very generous and very kind to him. And see what happens. If he still likes you, then he's a good friend. If all of a sudden he lets go of you, then you've just found out that he wasn't a true friend. So who, who, who needs to do this? One who's been very kind and generous to others. That's why he mentions this. Rabbi Mechalup, Nadiv, Ishmatan. These individuals who are generous and kind just happen to have many friends who come and befriend them and ask them for favors. This is usually in the Havashet Luyav Davar. It's not real friendship. It's not real Re'im. And you can test it out. Good advice. You know, there's, it's incredible when I talk to, especially to kids, teenagers, who have not gone through life and they don't have that much experience. They really, they're very innocent. They really believe that people are very friendly, very kind to them, and they can't see that there's something else there, that there's some interest perhaps, that it's not real friendship. And that is what Shalomo Melech, Hacham Yikol Adam, who was the wisest man, who had a lot of experience, gives us all this information firsthand so that we should avoid making the mistakes in trusting just anybody, giving loans uh, without uh, documenting the loan without witnesses, or uh, being a co-signer, which he totally discourages, which we spoke about many, many times. He says, just be careful. The rabbis tell us in different words, every human being, kabdeu v'hashdeu, give respect, be respectful of everyone, but be suspicious of him too. Just because one has a long beard does not mean anything. I think the Greek Orthodox priest also has a long beard. Yeah. But he has very different ideas than you and I. <laughs> so what? Uh, you know, the beard doesn't mean anything. Most of Muslims, they got too. Some, yeah, Muslims. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. So, it, it pays to learn what Shlomo Melech has to say in Mishle and in Kohelet, which is another very important book. Next pasuk. Kol rash seneuhu af ki rachaku mimenu meradefa marim lo hemma. Also a little bit uh, wordy or complex here, but the idea is very simple. All the kinsmen of a poor man, all his relatives, hate him, and surely his friends distance themselves from him. If his relatives don't like him, then surely his friends. He pursues statements that are not fit for him. Here it says that are fit for him because the word for him is written here lamed aleph, but you read it lamed vav. Lamed vav lo means for him. The way it's written here is Lamed Aleph, not for him. So there are two interpretations. Basically, this is what it means. All the relatives of a poor man don't like him. And why is it so? Because the relatives tend to feel it as a burden. They have to support. He's their relative. So they don't like it that he's a poor man, that he's not working, that he does not have a job. And the rabbis tell us, therefore, a person should be very careful not to be a burden on anybody. Otherwise, people won't like him. If you're going to be a burden on people, always asking them for favors and help. Second of all, the rabbis very much encourage one to, to be employed as the Yonah, the pigeon. The Midrash talks about the pigeon that Noah took into the Teva. You know, she had in her mouth a leaf of an olive tree. And the leaf of an olive tree is bitter. 
And the pigeon said, I would, prefer, I would prefer that my livelihood be as bitter as this leaf of an olive, but it be in the hands of Hashem directly, than to have a livelihood that is sweeter than honey, but to have to depend on people. It was a, if, you, if, if Hashem provides one with Panasad, that is the best. But to have to depend on people, it's not always the best thing. And especially if one is a burden on them. So that's why he says that the, the poor man's relative who feel that burden, they don't like the man. And the more so the friends who are not even his relatives. The last part of the Pasuk, Miradef Amarim Lohemma, he's pursuing Amarim. Amarim means statements that are not fit to him. What does that mean? He's telling people, oh, I have a rich uncle. I have a rich brother. I have a good friend. These are, are worthless. The Shlomo Melech says, because for the most part, these people will not come out to help you. So why even make the statement that you have a rich brother, a rich relative, a rich friend? These are the facts that people do not like. Someone who does not try to get himself a job and is dependent on others. He's a burden on others. There are many, many uh, Gemarot that talk about the importance of a person seeking a job even if it means washing dishes at a non-kosher restaurant. Washing dishes. But you're able to preserve your dignity, bring food to the table, and not have to open your hand to beg for money. There are Russian Jews who have arrived in Israel who were engineers, but they had no choice. They had to go and do sponja. You know, to sweep the floors, if that's all that was available. Some of them were too proud, so they had no money. What's better, to have no money or to let go a little bit of one's pride? The rabbis tell us, let go a little bit of your pride. The rabbis tell us, if you have to, go sell stinking hides. So hides, the skins of animals, stink. Go sell stinking hides and don't say that you it's, it's beneath you. It's beneath me. No, don't say that. Go do that if you have to and bring food to the table. Next pasuk. Kone lev ohev nafsho shomer tevuna. Limtsotov. He who acquires sense loves his soul. He who guards understanding will eventually find good. What, what he's saying over here is one who acquires understanding. What's understanding? The commentaries explain me dotovot. If you like yourself, then you, one should be working on himself to perfect himself, to perfect his midot, his character. A person who works on himself, it's just like the diet. People go on a diet because they like their physical body. Well, some people do it because they want to be healthy. But still, that's still the physical body. Right? Here we're talking about nafsho, the soul, the spirit. If you like your spirit, you care about your spirit, then you have to do what's important to the spirit. You have to work on the midot, on the character. Nobody's born a perfect individual. Everybody has something to perfect, to refine. And one who works on perfecting himself, on refining his character, that's called ohev nafsho. He likes his nefesh. Shomer Tebunadim Tzotov and one who preserves his understanding preserves that which he has learned that will help him Dim Tzotov to find good in this world and in the world to come he does not just learn it but he preserves it how do you preserve that which you learned? you review it, you repeat it many times over so that you do not forget all the, the learning, all the Chokhmah the next Pasuk is very similar to what we just saw before but there is an additional idea here here he translates a false witness will not go unpunished and one who speaks lies will perish so a false witness will not go unpunished we just saw that at some point he's going to get it he's not going to go unpunished you know a witness the reason why he puts so much emphasis on witness is because a witness is very very instrumental in, in, a, in a court of law he can do a lot of harm he can do a lot of damage so Hashem takes care of certain individuals in Olam in this world. He does not wait until Olam Abba. Certain individuals are paid in this world. There's a story that just came to my mind. You know, you're all familiar with how serious bribery is, right? The Torah says that bribery can affect even the wise. And our tradition says that anybody who accepts bribery will become blind. This is such a tradition, if he has accepted bribery. He becomes blind. Because what does a bribery do? It blinds one. So as a result of that, he will be blind. There was a great, great rabbi in Tunisia 
who as he was getting older became blind. So you know there are a lot of fools, in every community there's a bunch of clowns and fools. In, in Tunisia was no exception. And the, and the clowns started saying, you know, he's becoming blind, he must have taken bribes all these years in court. And you know what a rumor can do to an individual, it could ruin his reputation. Terrible. So as soon as he heard that, he felt terrible. He was a tzaddik. He was a righteous man. So he prayed to a Baruch Hu, Baruch Hu, you know the truth. If there is any truth to what they're saying, then leave me blind for the rest of my life. But if it's completely false, then show the entire community that it's false. Restore my eyesight. And his eyesight was restored. He was able to see again. Many things occur in this world. Not, in, not, not necessarily in the world to come. For the most part, the reward and punishment is reserved for the world to come. Life is too short for everything to be, for all business matters, as, I, as we can call it, to be resolved and taken care of in this world. So Hashem says, okay, we're going to take care of it over there. But sometimes, if it's something very serious, and there are certain categories that are very serious, Hashem takes care of the business down here. And one of them is false witness, false testimony. Now this, this false witness, the Shlomo Melech adds over here a few additional words. V'yafiach kezavim yoved. Yoved means that he will be lost, he will perish. What does that mean? What happens to an individual who lies a lot, he eventually believes in his own lies. And he eventually gets into a lot more trouble. And the rabbis tell us what is the punishment of a liar. Even when he speaks the truth, they won't believe him. Even when he begins to speak the truth, in other words, he will per- perish, not necessarily be destroyed completely, but he himself will be completely lost. Nobody will trust him, even when he speaks the truth. That's the punishment of a liar. Next pasuk. Lo silta anug meshol besarim. Pleasure does not defeat a fool, much less a slave to rule over princes. We're talking about pleasures here. As you know, there is all sorts of pleasures. And pleasures could be something good. There's nothing wrong with having a comfortable home. On the contrary, the rabbis tell us that a comfortable home, a beautiful woman, a nice furniture, marhivim da'atoshel adam, they widen a person's dot, in other words, his horizons, I guess. In other words, they give him a good feeling, he's able to learn well because he has a certain tranquility from having this this uh, comfort from a large home, a comfortable home, from an, a good looking wife, and from having nice furniture. So there's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, there is a benefit to be gained from having these things if you can afford it. And if you are blessed to have a beautiful wife. However, the, the, other, the other part of the story is as follows. That when these pleasures come into the hand of a seal, of a fool, it's no good. It does not befit him. As the Pasuk says, If if an individual becomes rich, especially if he becomes rich very quickly, he will become arrogant and he will forget Hashem. So there's always this danger uh, that these comforts or these luxuries... Because if one has any control over an individual, like a son, a child, one has to be able to limit all these things and not necessarily give him everything he wants because what he wants may not be fit for him instead of being something good and beneficial he may get himself into trouble you give a car to a teenager you know you're taking a big risk you know that you know why insurance is so much more expensive for teenagers because most of the accidents are teenagers I think if I, if I remember correctly from 16 to 20. They know the statistics, the insurance companies. They know the statistics very well. Right? And therefore, they they raise their rates accordingly. So it is not right to just give in, to give anything that the child, that the teenager desires. Because, It does not befit. I'm not calling the child a fool, but, you know, he is susceptible he, he does have certain weaknesses. He's still not completely mature. So pleasure does not defeat a fool. For the Chachamim, these comforts may be actually good. 
it may allow them to live a better life. They may be able to achieve a lot more having this comfort of a beautiful, expansive home and a nice wife and furniture. Yeah, but not for everybody. Why? Because it's just like Afkile Evid Mishol Besarim. It's just like slaves ruling over princesses. A slave to rule over a prince, what experience does he have? A, pr- a slave cannot rule over a prince. Does that make any sense? That a slave should rule over a prince? So therefore, Exil, since he, he misuses the pleasures, it's not correct to give to him what he, his heart desires. One has to limit what Exil desires. Next pasuk, Sechel Adam Ericha Poveti Parto Abor Al Pasha. It is a good sense for man to be slow to anger and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. We're talking about being tolerant to, or slow to anger, to be forgiving. Sechel Adam Ericha Po, what that means is that when a person was just insulted and he holds, his, he holds himself back, he controls himself, he does not get angry. That shows that he has Sechel, that he has intelligence. An individual who yells back at another individual, especially in public, which is also Hilul Hashem, very insulting, right? That shows that this individual has no Sechel. Po, if a person is tolerant, holds himself back, and it's difficult to do, if he does that, who's giving him that idea? It's coming from the Sechel, not from the heart. He's using his mind to control his senses. So to be Marich Af, to be slow to anger, to not respond to every insult, to not yell. That requires sechel. And not everybody uses their sechel. In Hebrew we say, wasab sechel. In other words, he did the right thing, he used his head to do the right thing. If he did not do the right thing, he may not have used the sechel. He went by his heart. He's angry, he's upset. So it's a beautiful midah, and it's an important midah to be erich apo, to control one's anger, to be tolerant. Vetifarto avor al pasha, and it's his it's glory. Glory means the beauty of an individual if he's avor al pasha. What's that? If he can pass over a transgression. The commentaries explain that passing over a transgression is a greater quality than being slow to anger. Why? The guy who is slow to anger, basically, this is the way he feels. He's very upset, but he doesn't show it. He doesn't respond. He doesn't react. That's commendable, right? The one who's ma'avir al-pesha, let's go of it. Doesn't even think about it anymore. He doesn't hold a grudge. The guy who's erich maybe still has a grudge. He just didn't, didn't show his anger. So they say avor al-pesha is even a greater quality. So much so that there's a story in the Gemara of there was a time when Amisrael needed assistance in Hashemayim I forget what it was and Rabbi Ezer went down to the Teva to be Hazan and he said 24 prayers very very strong prayers no response from heaven Rabbi Akiva came down and he said Avino Malkeno just a simple one request to Hashem and as soon as he said that Hashem answered his prayer the Gemara goes on to say, don't think that Rabbi Akiva is greater than Rabbi Yezer. It's not so. The reason Rabbi Akiva was answered, because he's Mavir al-Midotav. He passes over any transgression. He gives in. He, he forgives. He doesn't hold a grudge. He just lets go easily. Much more than the other rabbi, who maybe was tolerant, but he had a hard time, or he didn't want to, or whatever. He wasn't as... as Forgiving as Rabbi Kiva, you know, we can't, of course, imagine their level. So it's, you know, I have to be careful not to say anything about Rabbi Yezer. You know, I'm sure Rabbi Yezer was a great tzaddik, but he was on the level of Rabbi Kiva of being Mavir al Midotav. He wasn't. That is why Rabbi Kiva's prayers were answered quickly. Mavir al Midot, that's 